Hi, my name's Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Lance 850 today. Uh, starting out, we're going to talk about the remote and the jacks. So they use the Happy Jack wireless system here on the 850. Uh, and this is going to control that system. So to w turn the remote on and pair it with the board, we're going to push the two center buttons and the two top buttons. That's going to link everything up, make sure everything's ready to go. Now when we're looking at this remote, orientation is going to be from the rear. So we have driver side front, driver side rear, passenger side front, passenger rear, or all at the same time, either up or down. Now, if we kind of scoot on over here to the jack, uh, you do have the corresponding jacks on all four corners of the unit. Uh, in the event that uh, you have a power loss situation, the jacks are no, lo no longer corresponding with a remote, a scenario like that, we can actually operate these manually. So you'll remove this plug here, uh, on the inside, we're going to find an oversized crank handle, kind of looks like an oversized Allen head. Um, before we go and try and actually maneuver this manually, we do want to disengage each motor. So that's going to be in that down position there. That's going to disengage that motor. That will allow us to turn that drive and either up or down. Uh, of course, not something that uh, you're going to want to make a habit of doing. It's going to take you, you know, three times as long to either load or unload but it is nice to have the choice in the event of an emergency situation. Uh, also here on the remote, uh, we do have a, a looks like a, a telephone uh, jack receiver there. Uh, that's going to accept a communication cord. We would then, uh, in the event that say this remote runs out of battery, we can go ahead and manually plug this directly into the board. Again, operate that wirelessly uh, in the event that you would, would run out of battery here. Uh, moving on, we have your propane compartment here. And you have two 20-pound propane tanks. Now, these are going to be full for you when you pick up your unit. Uh, I find most people are somewhat familiar with these, this size tank. This is the same variant you're going to find on any gas grill. Uh, you have an open and closed valve on the top. They are held in there with a tension band here. So um, you're going to line up that uh, stud there. Go ahead and... Uh, latch that down. It is adjustable if you were to need to increase the tension on those bands. You don't need to go crazy just to keep them in place. Uh, separating the two tanks, you have an automatic switchover regulator. Uh, name of the game with that is whichever tank you are pointed at is going to initially draw off of that tank as long as we have this uh, valve up top open. If we use that tank in its entirely, and again we have this valve on this tank open, it's going to automatically switch over. Now, if you want to keep a, uh, you know, a, a better idea of where you sit on propane, there's nothing wrong with keeping this secondary valve in the closed position and then manually switching it over, uh, allowing you some time to go ahead and get this full so you, you're never truly out of propane. Now, here in the center, we have a, a pinwheel kind of indicator uh, if it says green, that means we have propane, propane flowing through the line. Uh, it doesn't tell you how much gas is in these tanks, but it does tell you that you have some. Now, if we're completely out of fuel, it's going to go ahead and switch over to red, and it, it does kind of pinwheel over. So, uh, potable water fill here. Now, this is going to be our kind of our off-grid option. Our, if we're uh, trying to fill that onboard water tank, we're going to go ahead and use this. We'll go ahead and take that cap off, stick a drinking water hose in there, fill it up to it overflows. Uh, once it is overflown, we're going to go ahead and uh, replace the cap. And just a reminder, we do need to use that onboard water pump to uh, pressurize that system, draw that water up from the tank uh, to the fixtures and make it usable. That switch is going to be located on the inside and we'll get to that, uh, of course, on the inside. Uh, just going to take a look down low, make sure we're not missing anything uh, here on the underside. And we do have some things going on down here. Uh, first up is going to be your city water connection here. Uh, now that's what you would use in the event uh, that you're in a RV park or you do have access to full-time running water. Uh, unlike that potable water tank, city water is pressurized directly from the line. Uh, more often than not, believe it or not, it is overpressurized. So these units are designed to have a working water pressure uh, anywhere between 40 to 75 PSI. So it is very important that we do not exceed that 75 PSI. Now we include a water pressure regulator with your purchase here. 
and that's going to be this guy here. Uh, it's always going to be my recommendation that you do go ahead and use a water pressure regulator anytime you are uh, using a city water connection. Uh, no matter the, the water pressure regulator, it's going to hook directly onto the spigot side of your hose. You're then going to screw your, your hose onto that. And then ultimately, you are screw your hose onto the trailer by rotating that trailer bound connection. Uh, these water pressure regulators are, are readily available any place with an RV aisle, uh, any, any, uh, any Walmart. Uh, again, any place with an RV aisle is going to have one of these. It's definitely my recommendation to uh, use that at all times. Uh, also here on the underside, we have a cable satellite inlet. So that's going to be directly behind or underneath this door here. And uh, this is just a standard RG6 cable fitting that passes through to the designated TV area of the camper. So some higher end campgrounds will offer a park cable, cable service as well as just about every satellite provider is offering a package geared towards our viewers. Either way, that's gonna be the inlet of those services and uh, they will again feed to the designated TV area of the camper. Uh, also here on the underside, we do have your black tank flush. Uh, that corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank. Now I know that we haven't spoke too terribly much uh, about the, um, you know, the operation of the black water tank and, and the septic side of things. Uh, we're going to kind of just pause on that. I'll go ahead and reference that when we do get to the backside and we actually get eyes on the valves. Uh, it's going to make uh, more sense uh, when we talk about it then. Uh, back up top here, we have your 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. Uh, it is only going to be accommodated one way into the unit. You have one L-shaped prong. Uh, of course, line those up. And as long as everything's in line, it's going to plug straight in. Uh, once we are fully inserted, you'll give it an eighth inch turn to the right. That locks it in. And then we do have this secondary collar here. We're going to screw down, lock it in further. Uh, number one recommendation I can make for any unit that I deliver is going to be the addition of a 30 amp surge protector. It is very important, uh, if not the most important thing you can do to protect your investment, your expensive electronics here on the inside. Uh, if you have any questions on function or, or what surge protector is going to be best for you, uh, please don't hesitate to give our parts department a call. They'd be more than happy to educate you uh, further on the importance and functions of a surge protector. Uh, also, we have a 30 to 15 amp reducer here that's going to go ahead and reduce that 30 amp 110 volt connection uh, to a standard 15 amp connection. This is beneficial if you want to plug the unit into your garage at home, uh, allow you to, to check some of those lower draw appliances, allow you to pre-cool the refrigerator, things like that. Uh, this puck style reducer will do well for that. Uh, now if you want to do some, some kind of higher draw functions like run the air conditioner or or really do some, some 15 amp kind of camping, it's gonna be my recommendation to upgrade from this kind of streamlined puck style reducer uh, to what they would call a dog bone style reducer, which uh, just separates these two ends with about 12 inches worth of cord. Uh, what that's going to do is dissipate heat a lot better uh, for again, those higher draw appliances. So something to think about there. Uh, moving on, we have your uh, six gallon capacity Atwood Dometic water heater here. Uh, this is dual source, runs on uh, 110 volt electricity as well as propane gas with 12 volt uh, direct spark ignition. Uh, other than function, which is very easy, it's, it's the, you know, there's no pilot light to light or anything like that. It is as easy as a flip of a switch. Uh, manufacturer recommends two very specific um, things. Number one is going to be draining the water heater separate of the system if the unit's going to be in storage for more than seven days. Uh, the backside of that is of course if the before using the unit it's very important that we prime or pump six gallons of water into the water heater before uh, lighting it. So uh, that process should look something like this. Uh, of course we're going to give it ample time to cool down generally two or three hours or three to four hours uh, at the least. Uh, once you're fairly confident of the temperature, it's very important that we de depressurize it. Now you have a couple options on how you depressurize it and you'll figure out which one makes the most sense for you. 
Uh, but ultimately, you can go ahead and use the pressure relief valve here on the unit itself. Uh, you would just uh, overcome that spring tension here until that, uh, this little metal piece is in line. Uh, that's, of course, not the best option because it's, it's of course, under pressure and it, it kind of makes a mess. You have to be careful that you're not going to scald yourself, things like that. Uh, easier than, than that is going to be using uh, any hot side of any fixture within the unit. So uh, whether that's your outside shower here, your kitchen sink, your bathroom sink, either one, as long as we have cut the inlet flow of water to the unit completely, if we go ahead and turn that hot side of the spigot on, it's going to depressurize the water heater. So once that water heater is, of course, uh, at a workable temperature and has also been depressurized, we're then going to come here uh, to the drain plug here. We're going to use a 15 16 wrench and go ahead and back that drain plug out. Uh, again, very important that we do depressurize at first. If not, once we go to go ahead and back this drain plug out, it's going to again be under pressure. It's going to spit that water kind of uncontrollably from this orifice here. So it is very important that we do depressurize at first. Uh, now to feed water to the unit, which we're going to want to do at the start of each trip, uh, is very, very simple and it's going to uh, be very similar to depressurizing it. So we're going to introduce a flow of water into the unit. Once we have water running into the unit itself, we're again going to, to uh, utilize the hot side of the spigot of our choice or the, the fixture of our choice. Uh, in, in this example, say that was the outside shower. I'm going to go ahead and turn this valve on. I'm going to turn the sprayer on and allow that, that, that flow to normalize. See, initially that flow is going to be very airy, very spitty, bubbly. Uh, what it's doing is it is uh, everything you see at the fixture is actually passing through the water heater. So uh, again, initially it's very airy, flowy as it's working the air from the appliance itself. Once that flow normalizes, that is truly your indicator that you have six gallons of water in here. You can go on the inside and choose your source. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a dual source water heater uh, to give you kind of a, a feeling of, of recharge rates and things like that. If you are using both sources, uh, 110 volt as well as propane gas, it's going to give you a recharge rate of 17 gallons per hour. If you're using propane gas with the 12 volt ignition, you're looking at 15 gallons per hour. And then with standalone electricity, it's going to be 11 gallons per hour. So that's going to be uh, your recharge rates there. And then uh, one last recommendation I do make with the water heater here uh, is going to be the addition of some bug screening material uh, over this grating here. Uh, now that goes not only for the water heater, but for all of the propane appliances, propane burning appliances within the unit. Uh, here in Texas, mud daubers in particular are attracted to the smell of propane, uh, as are just about every flying insect. What happens is they, they're, they're small enough to crawl through this grating here. They, they, they infiltrate the appliance as deep as they can and they build their dirt nest as close to that flow of propane as they can. Uh, generally leaving the appliance inoperable uh, and it is very costly to, to clean them out once they have nested inside. So a little bit of money up front, a little bit of work to screen these off is going to be the best in the long run. So just something to keep in mind there. Uh, outside shower here, access to hot and cold water. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, uh, is the fact that this hose does, does feed up into the cabinetry. Uh, now, I have heard of people, uh, since they don't constantly see water here at the valve, they forget, at the fixture, they forget that they have the valve on here uh, as designed. That go ahead and feeds up into the cabinetry. And if it's not seated 100% properly, you can go ahead and shut the door and actually turn that sprayer on. Uh, I have heard again of people dumping their fresh water tank uh, into the cabinetry of the unit. So just something to be aware of there. Uh, storage here, nothing too crazy there. Uh, and then again, we have a sewage hose compartment there. Uh, that's where you're going to store, store your sewage hose. That way you don't have to uh, keep it with the unit. So it just fits in there um, like so. So can it be easier than that? Uh, here on the back side, uh, starting with your dump valves here, you unlock this compartment here. So this is your, this is where your dump valves are going to be. This is where you're not only going to dump your uh, wastewater, but also your uh, low point drains as well. 
So you can see a bayonet fitting transitioning through the floor. Uh, that is a very standard RV connection there. Uh, and that's going to accommodate a, a sewage hose of your choice. Now we do include this one with the unit. Uh, as with any sewage hose, uh, it's going to connect the very same way this cap comes off. So uh, you have four prongs along the outside of that unit. We're gonna put this guy in that halfway position, give it a quarter turn to lock everything on. Uh, so that's super simple. And that's going to again be the same with any uh, sewage hose of your choice. Now, kind of a lot going on in this compartment, and I'm not sure it's all going to translate very well to uh, film, but starting with your low point drain. So we already talked about the importance of draining the water heater in the event that the unit is gonna be in storage for, for more than seven days. Uh, ultimately, before draining that water heater, you would have already drained these low point drains. Now you have three clear hoses here if we trace those clear hoses up, there's going to be valves there as well. Uh, and then again, I'm not sure if those, those color of those lines are on the film as well, but you have one line is going to be your cold side of your plumbing. One line is going to be the hot side of your plumbing, and the other is going to dra drain your freshwater holding tank. And then these valves are right here. So uh, again, kind of to bring things full circle, the train of thought is we're going to start here. We're going to open all three of those valves, allow all of that water to drain out uh, before going up to the water heater and then uh, going through that process that I outlined earlier. So that's how we're going to dump all the water from the unit. Again, we're gonna be doing that anytime the unit is gonna be in storage for more than seven days. Um, so we've done that. Uh, that's going to be, again, your, your general storage procedure as well as winterization. Uh, now also in this same compartment, we have your, your septic dump valves as well. So we have black for black water and gray for gray water. Uh, black water is anything that comes from the toilet. So your body waste is here and your uh, liquid waste is here. So that's going to be sink water, shower water, relatively clean water uh, is considered gray water. Of course, the, the black water is the, the nasty water. So uh, rule of thumb with these generally is anytime you are hooked up to full-time septic or, or really anytime, uh, this black water valve needs to be in a closed position. It's very important, especially with that solid body waste that we keep that in as wet or flowing condition as we can. And of the only way to do that is to keep that in the closed position and use the monitor panel on the inside and only dump as necessary. So uh, black water valve is in the closed position here. We're going to watch that monitor panel on the inside. Uh, once we are uh, satisfied with the level of full, we're gonna come out here and we're gonna give this a six inch pull towards you. That's going to dump that tank. Uh, now. Treat these kind of like a vacuum lock. These two valves should never be open at the same time. You want to avoid any uh, chance of, of cross-contamination cross or backfeeding or anything like that. So uh, I, I, one or the other. And a popular option is going to be, of course, pulling this black water valve, letting that evacuate completely, closing that valve, and then go ahead and pull this gray water, allowing that gray water to, to rinse not only your sewage hose, but the, the small amount of shared plumbing uh, that they too have. Now earlier we had eyes on that black, uh, that black water flush. Now again, that black water flush corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank. It's specifically designed to help uh, blast off compounded toilet waste, uh, toilet paper, things like that. It's, it's a, a, a really, really cool uh, function. It's going to keep your tank sensors uh, reading accurately longer. It's going to, again, keep everything free flowing a lot better, um, which is awesome. So uh, it does have its limitations though. So there's no check valve within that tank. There's, there's no um, safety, secondary safety or anything to keep that from potentially uh, overflowing that tank. Now, uh, if that black tank is overflown, generally that valve in the toilet is enough to keep that water within the tank but uh, the path of least resistance is going to be the rooftop septic vents. So you have kind of three options when it comes to operating that black tank flush. Um, the least efficient or the, 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 the one that's going to work the least is going to be um, kind of your fail safe option, which would be to leaving this valve in the open position. We're going to hook onto that black tank flush and then we can essentially let that water run indefinitely because this valve isn't closed. 
Uh, of course, we're not going to get that, that kind of rinsing action that, that is going to uh, be best for cleaning that tank out. Now, you, you, if you think you may be distracted or, or get busy doing something else, uh, that's definitely going to be my recommendation to, to flush that tank that way. Now, uh, your second option is going to be closing this black water valve here, hooking into that black tank flush there on the underside, uh, and giving and let water rushing into that tank for no more than five minutes. Um, then, of course, relieving the pressure here. Uh, that's, of course, going to be good. Uh, that's going to work well, but you're going to kind of be doing it blind. Uh, you do run a, a small risk of either overflowing uh, or, or not rinsing it enough. Now, probably the best case scenario is going to be with the use, with the, the help of a friend. Uh, they could be on the inside physically watching that monitor panel rise as you're allowing water to flush, to, to flow into that tank uh, from the connection there on the other side. They holler at you to go ahead and pull the valve here and then we go ahead and evacuate that water and waste uh, at that time. Uh, now again, I, I mentioned that this is a sewage hose that is included with the unit. Uh, there are definitely better options available. This is designed to get you started. Uh, when it does come to upgrade, it's going to be my recommendation to go ahead and upgrade with one with a clear elbow on the end. Uh, the reason being is when you're utilizing this black tank flush, you can wash that water uh, or rinse the tank until that water runs relatively clear uh, again, giving you a, a good indicator that that tank is free of, of body waste and things like that. So, uh, also, uh, here on the back side, you know, we got your awning here. Of course, we don't have the room to bring it out in this space. Uh, if you do have any questions of that, that's pretty well covered online. Uh, we can point you in the direction of, of that uh, if need be. You have your rear view camera. Uh, that's going to correspond with a, a, a monitor panel that's going to be installed in your vehicle. It is a Bluetooth wireless system. Uh, so what that means for you is anytime the marker lights are on on the camper, you're going to have that full rear view. Um, works very well. Uh, also, we have rooftop ladder access. Uh, brings me to a good point, which is going to be structural maintenance. Uh, anywhere on this unit where two pieces come together, whether that's on the roof or on the body or sidewalls of the camper, uh, anywhere where two pieces come together, they are using some sort of sealant. Uh, it's going to be our goal to maintain that sealant and catch any degradation as soon as possible. Uh, so we're going to get, we're going to put this unit on a 90 day maintenance schedule. What that means for you is once every 90, day, 90 days, we're going to do a 360 degree top to bottom inspection of all of those seals. Uh, here on the sidewalls of the camper, generally you're going to find a butyl, uh, paired with a 100% silicone uh, product. You could, of course, so source uh, either one of those uh, generally at a hardware store uh, or, again, any RV dealer is going to carry those products as well. Uh, on the roof, we're going to use a couple different products uh, that are going to be slightly harder to source. You're probably definitely going to have to get those from an RV dealer. But what you're going to find up there is you're going to find a combination of uh, butyl-backed vinyl roof tape as well as a self-leveling lap sealant. Uh, again, we're looking for any gaps, cracks, uh, you know, degradation of those seals, whether that be here on the sidewalls uh, or on the roof. We want to catch those immediately uh, and, and touch up as necessary. And again, that's going to be a 90-day maintenance schedule uh, with this unit. Uh, keyless entry here on the unit. Now, when you pick up your unit, your code's going to be 1234. Uh, then you hit the unlock, one, two, three, four, and then lock. So pretty straightforward. Uh, of course, runs on four AA batteries. Uh, they'll be replaced here on the back side of the unit. Uh, depending on the model, uh, they've, they've kind of moved on between locks, so you may or may not see this on your unit, uh, depending on what, uh, you know, what month the uh, unit was made in. Uh, either way, but your four AA batteries here underneath these two screws, it's going to indicate to you when they need to be changed. Uh, with any kind of technology similar to this, uh, I would keep a spare key outside of the unit. Uh, again, especially since this runs on batteries, I would not uh, bet my lunch, uh, so to speak, that that's going to be the kind of end all be all uh, entry into the unit. Uh, standard RV style handrail as well. Uh, locks in the out position, 
you'll lift up, fold across the door for uh, transit. So, uh, license plate, brackets, taillights, things like that uh, are all pretty straightforward stuff. So moving on here. Uh, here on this side, um, we of course have your carefree awning. Uh, we're going to get to the operation of that there on the inside. Uh, we also have your uh, speakers and porch lights, things like that. Again, we're going to get to on the inside. Uh, we're going to flip those switches and, and, and point those out. Uh, we have your refrigerator vent here. Uh, very important. Again, we're going to start off with protecting it from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, this is the grating. Uh, this is your vent cover. And as you can see, there are holes there in the louvers. And we want to further screen this off. Again, keep the mud divers flying insects from nesting in the appliance. Uh, other than protecting it as well, uh, poke your head in there, give it a visual inspection a couple times a year, make sure nothing's gotten in, make sure there's nothing nesting in there. Uh, you'll be good to go. So not really, again, from a maintenance standpoint, not much you're going to be doing from this side of things. It's not really what we would consider a customer serviceable unit. Uh, operations are all going to be done from the inside of the unit. Uh, as well. So pretty straightforward there. When it does come to uh, accessing the compartment or replacing the vent here, we're going to put the uh, vent bottom first. So there's some tabs. We need to line up those tabs once those are uh, lined up properly. And this can this one can be a little trickier than most. Uh, we're going to line up the square holes there. Once we're seated and everything's flush, we're going to give those a, a quarter turn there. Uh, make sure that's locked in. I go back and, and give it a second check. Uh, that way, uh, again, I know that it's locked in. Uh, a lot of people lose these going down the road because uh, they're either not installed properly, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, really that's, that's the only reason why you would lose it going down the road is because it wasn't installed properly. Uh, and then below that, uh, we have your propane burning 12-volt uh, furnace here. Uh, Exhaust vent is here. Of course, most importantly, we're going to let it exhaust. Uh, other than that, again, it kind of fits in that same category with the refrigerator, not really a customer serviceable unit. Uh, other than protecting it from the intrusion of mud divers and flying insects, generally not much you're going to be doing from this side of things. Uh, although most importantly, this is an exhaust, let it breathe. Uh, you know, being the, this, this side awning here, you're probably going to be your, this is probably going to be your, your kind of porch area. Uh, make sure you're not putting any lawn chairs or, or anything in front of that vent. Uh, again, does blow very hot air when it is on. Uh, will melt whatever you put in front of it. Uh, we have a couple auxiliary battery terminals here. If I can get the if I can get the door open there. Uh, so uh, Inside this unit, we have two Group 24 deep cycle batteries. Uh, they are located into the step uh, underneath the step up uh, into the cab over uh, sleeping area. Because they're, again, not the easiest to access, but they are also in a sealed battery box, they give you two kind of auxiliary terminals out here to do any battery maintenance or, uh, you know, tending, things like that. Uh, you can do that from right out here. Uh, allowing you to, to not have to access those batteries on a regular basis. Now, uh, the batteries that are installed by us into the unit are going to be uh, interstate D-cycle batteries. Now, they are a lead-acid battery, which does carry a bit of maintenance. So you should be uh, pulling those, those tops off of those battery boxes once every 90 days. We're then going to pull the vent panels off the battery itself, and we're going to refill with distilled water as necessary. So you're going to find uh, underneath those vent panels, a clear marked water level, uh, and it is just our goal to maintain that water level. And again, um, distilled water is what we're going to do that with. So, so very important that we use only distilled water to do so. Below that, we have a couple of all-weather 110 volt outlets there. Uh, chances are you have some of these on the outside of your house. It is just a standard 15 amp outlet. Uh, and then below that, we have your auxiliary propane line here. Now this ties into the propane system of the unit and you can utilize this to uh, power uh, any high flow propane appliance, whether that's going to be a gas grill, uh, propane heater, propane fireplace, either one, as long as it's a high flow, pro high flow propane appliance you, and you have the corresponding uh, 
the corresponding line, you can go ahead and use this. Now this utilizes a quick disconnect coupler. Uh, how that works is you're going to slide the locking collar back here. You would insert the male end fully. Once you are fully inserted, that's going to snap back and lock on. Now then uh, you do need to turn this valve and just like with any valve, if we are uh, with the flow of propane, that's going to be on against the flow is going to be off. Uh, and then lastly, just going to stick my head down here, make sure we're not missing anything here on the underside of the camper and there's nothing here on this side. So we're all set to uh, hop on the inside and take a look at those functions. Uh, we'll see you in there. Alrighty, so here on the inside of the unit, uh, we're, we're going to initially talk about your switch cluster here. Uh, most of your, your external lights are going to be uh, utilized here. So this is going to be, first up is going to be your uh, porch lights, I guess you would call them. Uh, but these are labeled left, right, uh, and rear. Now these are three-way switches. So of course middle like that is going to be off. If we go down, uh, that's going to be a bright white LED light all the way around. Uh, if we go all the way up, that's going to be an amber colored, uh, more conducive light to actually utilizing these spaces after dark. So some people call it a bug light, but really it's just a less intrusive light. Uh, so we'll turn those off. Uh, this next up, this is going to be what they call a courtesy light. So this is just a common switch we can hit coming into the unit at dark. Uh, that's going to, in this case, turn on these two lights above the dinette. Uh, to light your space uh, so you can at least get inside the unit. Uh, docking lights here. Now these are going to be, these lights are going to be on the rear only and these are again just some bright white LED lights uh, to help light out this, this external space here. Uh, backup camera switch here. Now I, I indicated earlier that that camera would be on anytime the, the marker lights are, are on. Uh, and that's incorrect for this particular model. So this, they, they have switched this um, switch this unit. So anytime this switch is on, your camera is going to be on. The reason why they do that is because uh, on the dinette area, we have a 12 volt cigarette lighter style receptacle. The idea being is that you can take your monitor panel, you can of course plug it into that 12 volt cigarette lighter style receptacle there, and then we can turn this switch on. And then at that point, that rear view camera acts like a door camera. Uh, so you can kind of see who's walking up on your unit and knocking on your door. So a pretty cool feature there. Uh, and it is the addition of the switch is nice. Uh, below that, we also have that, uh, that looks like an old telephone handset jack. Uh, I referenced that at the very beginning of the presentation. Uh, that is where we are going to plug in our remote in the event that we uh, need to, you know, say this runs out of battery, we're going to plug our remote right in there. And again, just a reminder, orientation of your remote is going to be the, from the rear. Uh, so the location of that port is, is uh, really smart. Uh, below that, we have our first, pace, first piece of safety equipment is going to be your fire extinguisher. Uh, now, it is very important to test all safety equipment before going down the road. Uh, for the fire extinguisher in particular, that's going to be pushing this green test tab down. If it springs back, that means we still have pressure in the unit. Uh, if it stays depressed, it's time to pull that unit out and replace that fire extinguisher. Uh, so coming into the unit, I'm going to hop right up to your fantastic fan here. Uh, now, uh, this is a 12 volt appliance here. Uh, we can go ahead and crank it open with the crank handle here in the front right corner. Uh, from there, we go ahead and choose a speed. Uh, you have three speeds there, one, two, and three. And then we also have a thermostat here. So we can set this to a specific comfort level and then this fan is going to kick on and off to maintain that comfort level. So it, it, uh, it's nothing scientific. You're going to, need to have to figure out which, you know, where on this scale you like it. But uh, it is nice to have that feature, especially throughout the night. It can kick on and off to, again, maintain a temperature. Uh, very important that we do go ahead and close this before going down the road. Um, chances are, if you forget, uh, it may not be there when you get to where you're going. Uh, also have a, a bus style glass fuse in here. Uh, it is a four amp fuse. Uh, not a bad idea to maybe keep a spare, although they, they generally don't go out very often. Uh, but if, if you are kind of off grid betting on this to, to circulate air, uh, you, you would definitely want a replacement there. Uh, so stepping up here into the dinette, first thing we have is the, the bunk, uh, the bunk kind of secondary bunk area here. Uh, now what you have, is a bar latch on each side. 
if we go ahead and, and undo those latches, this is going to fold down. Uh, on the back side of this cabinet, you'll see a little piece of wood here. Uh, you can lay that over the inside of these cabinet doors. Uh, and again, the idea is you could use that for a secondary uh, sleeping area. Um, although I believe it carries a, a hundred pound max capacity. Uh, so designed of course for small children. So, uh, also here in the dinette area, we're going to go over the windows. Now, all of the windows in this unit, uh, except for the emergency exit are going to operate the same. Uh, what you're going to find is you're going to find a, a fold out pivot point there that will then allow you to go ahead and crank that window out. Uh, it goes out to about eight inches and then we'll go ahead and, and crank it back in once we're fully in we go ahead and we fold that down uh, keeps everything nice and contained uh, they also do have these projector style shades so uh, that's going to be your uh, working shade that's going to let some light through uh, and then if you uh, pull this uh, privacy shade down that's going to of course could be like kind of your blackout option uh, or again your privacy shade there just give them a slight pull and that will allow them to retract. Uh, also, um, excuse me, also we have your, uh, another sleeping area here on the, the dinette. Uh, what that's going to do is utilize this tabletop. That's gonna go ahead and sit right here uh, on these slats there. Then we're going to reconfigure the cushions and allow that to uh, fill out that bed. If you have any questions on, on how that works, again, don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, we can walk you through that on the phone. Uh, also down low, we, we got eyes already on the, the 12 volt cigarette lighter style receptacle, but uh, I didn't mention that you do have a couple USBs there. Uh, also to the right of that's going to be your main GFI outlet. Uh, that's very important to take note on that. Uh, all these receptacles within the unit are going to be on the same circuit. If one of them gets overloaded, uh, they all do, so to speak, and that's gonna be the reset point uh for you so it functions very much like the 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 gfi receptacle inside your your bathroom or most bathrooms have a gfi receptacle uh although it, again reset button directly on the receptacle uh poking our heads here into the restroom not too terribly much that i'm going to school you on in there these are pretty basic these wet and dry baths uh you're going to have a uh the flush is going to be on the right side of the bowl, left side if you're sitting on it. Uh, it's going to be a hand flush. What that means for you is a, a slight pull is going to fill the bowl with water. A full pull is going to flush the bowl. Always a good idea to keep water in the bowl. That's gonna help keep the bad smells down. Um, also, it goes without saying, you need to use a RV grade toilet paper, single ply generally, uh, and as well as chemical treatment, deodorizers, tissue dissolvers, things like that. Uh, again, I'm going to recommend if you have any questions on which products to use, feel free to give our parts department a call. Uh, they would be more than happy to educate you further on which products you should be using. Uh, other than that, you have a standard sink with a diverter for the shower head. Uh, shower head's going to have an on off switch on the actual head that's going to allow you to conserve uh, water consumption without changing your mix down there on the valve. So uh, it does have a, a pretty straightforward on off switch. Uh, medicine cabinet, things like that are pretty straightforward. Uh, and then you have a little bit of storage here on the underside uh, for your, your, as well as your toilet paper holder. Uh, and then also further into that cabinet and just, just not gonna spend too much time on it, but you have a couple valves there. Uh, those valves, believe it or not, are going to cut the, in, the inflow of water to that outside shower. Uh, you know, not super important, but uh, reason why they're there is that outside shower is generally the first thing to freeze in cold weather so uh, rather than than uh, winterize it uh, it might be easier for you if it's not something that you're going to use often to just go ahead and, and cut that flow of water into it so again not going to spend too much time uh, on it but uh, they are there so so it's worth noting uh, also here we have your bathroom light switch there it is on the lighted switch because of course when the door is closed uh, you can't rightfully see that uh, door kind of locks in that in that uh, closed position. Then you have a little button here to allow you to, to open it. Um, so coming here into the kitchen area, um, you know, uh, normal stuff here. Nothing too crazy with the cabinetry. We do have access to your backside of your water heater from this uh, cabinet here. Uh, now that's important to note uh, specifically for winterization. 
Uh, now it is important that we do bypass that water heater before introducing the antifreeze into the system. Um, now we've kind of went through the, the meat of that process, which is going to be draining all the water from the unit. So we're going to follow those. Uh, that's of course includes the water heater and the three valves there on the underside. Uh, once we have done that, we're going to come in here and we're going to bypass the water heater. So right there, when you open that compartment, you have this valve here. Of course, they give you instructions on how to do it, but we are just going to move that valve into the secondary position and that is now bypassed. Uh, the reason why we want to bypass that water heater is a couple of reasons. Uh, of course, we don't want to pump six gallons of water or six gallons of antifreeze into the water heater. Number one, because that's a lot of antifreeze that would otherwise be wasted in the water heater. And number two, because it's a closed system, it's not the easiest to flush out, especially of a, a closed container like that. Um, so because of those reasons, it is important that we do go ahead and bypass that water heater. I'm just going to return that into the usable position there. Uh, also, the, the and again, I'm going to talk about it here briefly, but we'll, we'll probably touch base on it again. Uh, once, once that water heater is bypassed, you're next gonna, going to go to the water pump. Uh, we're going to trace a vacuum line up from the water pump, and that's where we're actually going to introduce our antifreeze. Uh, again, we're going to talk about it here in a few minutes. I believe it is underneath the sink there. Uh, so once I get kind of closer to that, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and talk about that. Uh, here into the kitchen area of the unit, uh, kind of starting up high, uh, we have a standard run-of-the-mill microwave, just like at home, uh, although it doesn't have a turntable. So you don't have to worry about that turntable rattling loose in there uh, when you're going down the road. Other than the, the, the lack of a turntable, operation is going to be very standard as to what you uh, are probably used to. Uh, again, very standard. You have a, a light there on, uh, above the stove, a, a vent fan. Uh, again, this is pretty kind of normal stuff. So up top here, we're going to see the, the uh, external transition to the hood vent for your stove. Uh, very important that we do open and close these uh, with use. Uh, so there are just some tabs. We're just going to pull those out. Uh, that's going to go ahead and open it. And then, uh, of course, it's very important that we do open it before cooking a meal. Uh, we don't want that hot air that's being sucked off of the, the stove top to uh, melt this or do any damage to it. Uh, and then in that same breath, we want to make sure we close it before going down the road to keep any uh, weather or road debris out uh, from the, the cavity there. You have a piezo igniter here for the, the cooktop. Uh, what that means for you is if you turn the burner on here, you can go ahead and rotate this. Uh, and as long as you have propane flowing through the line, uh, it will then go ahead and ignite for you. You're going to be lighting this oven a uh, slightly different, kind of a more antiquated way. Uh, we're going to start off by turning it to pilot here. And just like any other pilot, we actually have to hold that knob in uh, to get that flow of propane initiated. Uh, so while holding that in, we're going to take our long stem barbecue lighter and we're going to put our flame as close to we can as in between those prongs. A little hard to see, doesn't generally translate exceptionally well on the camera. Uh, but once you kind of open it up and look at it, you can't miss it. So just uh, put your flame in between those two prongs while holding this in the pilot. Once you see a little flame light or the pilot light, give it a few, few seconds longer to heat up that thermal coupler uh, and then release it here. That, that pilot's going to stay on. Then you can physically choose your temperature here. So pretty straightforward, uh, just a little different. And then again, while I'm kind of down here, uh, we'll go ahead and talk about that vacuum line for the, uh, for the uh, winterization process. Now, again, kind of a tight fit in here. I'm not exactly sure how well this is going to do on camera, uh, but real at the rear of that, cam of that compartment, we have a little indicator. Now, it's going to read winterize and normal, and it's going to have a little um, indicator that you can flip in between the two. So in this case, if we were winterizing, we would have already drained all the water from the unit. We would have bypassed the water heater, and then we're going to reach back there and we're going to flip that switch into the up position. Uh, once it's in the up position, anytime we run the water pump from there on out, we're going to have vacuum at, the, at this line here. Now the train of thought is we, we take our bottle of RV grade antifreeze, we go ahead and we stick this directly into that bottle, and then with that switch in that secondary position, we go from fixture to fixture. We run both sides of each fixture, so both the hot and the cold side. And then once we see that antifreeze actually come through the fixture here, 
that is our indicator that we are uh, winterized. Uh, give it a few seconds uh, once you see the antifreeze actually at the fixture uh, to run through the, the backside of that plumbing to fill any P traps on the way out. So that's just going to be your uh, vacuum line. Uh, that's where you're going to, uh, again, introduce that antifreeze. Uh, of course, you have, you know, uh, plumbing and, and ducting and things like that. So uh, it goes without saying, just be careful with what you store in here. You don't want to puncture uh, any of that important stuff. Uh, so also here in the kitchen area, uh, I mean, you got your sprayer here, um, different spray modes there. It can also pull out as well. Um, you know, light here, uh, again, nothing too, too out of the realm there. Uh, awning lights here, that, that's on a lighted switch because when that awning is in the end position, you can't actually see those lights. So if they get turned on inadvertently, uh, it's nice to know. And then we have your awning control uh, below that. Uh, this would be the off position there. Uh, now this awning is equipped with, it's a one touch carefree awning equipped with wind protection. So to utilize it and also to turn on that wind protection, this switch needs to be in that on position. So from there, once that switch is in the on position, we go ahead and we, we uh, push that button one time for the direction of travel. Uh, that's going to go ahead and bring the awning out. Now, if something were to uh, jump out in front of you or you did need to stop that awning, uh, hit that button in, uh, once more in the direction it's going, that's going to stop the awning. Now, if from there you wanna go ahead and, and, and bring it back in or go the opposite direction, we can go ahead and hit it there. Uh, and that's gonna go ahead and bring that awning all the way in. Again, anytime you're utilizing that wind protection, uh, this switch does need to be in the on, on position. Now again, uh, it's a really, really nice feature. It works very, very well. But again, with, with any sort of technology like that, I would not bet my lunch on it. Uh, never leave that awning out and unattended. Um, it is a very expensive awning, uh, and I would not, um, you know, allow this wind protection to um, take over kind of common sense. So keep that in mind there. Uh, below that, we have your uh, convenience center, monitor panel, uh, courtesy center, things. It goes by, by multiple different names. Uh, here on the right side, we're going to have push buttons. That's going to indicate to you the level of full of those tanks. Uh, so the more lights you see, the fuller it is, uh, and that goes for the battery or the tanks. Uh, on the left side of that indicator, so on this side here, it's going to give us actual uh, voltage. And then on the right side, it's going to give us levels of full. So you have, you know, one third, two thirds, and full. If we push the button corresponding, uh, you know, it's going to indicate uh, the level of full there. Uh, and then here we have your uh, switches for first up is going to be your water pump. If that red light's on, uh, that means your water pump's on. And then this is going to be your sources for your water here. So middle one's going to be gas. Bottom one's going to be electric. As I stated here on the outside, you can run both at the same time with no problems. It's going to give you the highest recharge rate. Uh, next up is going to be gas. And then lastly is going to be um, electric. So that would be electric there. Uh, pay attention to this DSI fault light uh, when you're running it here on gas. That's your direct spark ignition. Uh, now, what that means is uh, this, these, these water heaters on propane, they uh, go through a lighting cycle. What that means is it's going to try and light three times. If by the end of that third, si the end of that third try, if it hasn't lit, it's going to indicate that DSI fault light um, and stop trying to light. So ultimately that, that's your indicator on whether or not the water heater is lit. If you come back five minutes later and that DSI fault light's on, uh, that means the water heater has not lit. Uh, either you're out of propane gas, uh, your valve is closed on the tank, uh, or just not kind of unlikely in a unit of this size, but possibly it may just not have made its way over to the appliance. Uh, either way, um, in that event, correct the issue, uh, turn the switch off, turn it back on, it's going to cycle another three times as long as you have corrected the issue. It generally will light on the first try of that second cycle. Uh, below that, um, we have your Jensen unit here. Now this is CD, DVD, uh, AM, FM radio, Bluetooth. All of those features are going to be utilized on that single unit. 
um, corresponds with the television, like I said. Uh, generally, I find most people are, are pretty, you know, can work themselves around these units fairly easily. Uh, one thing to pay attention is going to be to your zones here. Now you have three zones in this particular unit. Uh, one's going to be for the bedroom area, which is generally, so A is usually above the dinette here, B is usually for the bedroom, and C is going to be for the outside. Now again, you control each zone's volume separately. Uh, pay attention to the volume that's going to the outside in zone C especially. Uh, generally, you kind of know, know people uh, who are unfamiliar with their equipment because they'll be playing something here on the inside and inadvertently uh, playing it to the outside. Uh, other than that, chock full of functions here. Uh, again, AM, FM radio, Bluetooth, CD, DVD. Uh, pair button is here. You have your uh, play, pause, and seek modes there. Uh, main mode button here, settings, presets. Uh, 3.5 millimeter jack inlet as well as a USB inlet. If you're if you're utilizing the CD player, just uh, put your disc in the slot there. Uh, flipping around here to the refrigerator, um, this has this utilizes a physical button to turn the unit on and off, and then from there it's going to be a touch screen. Uh, so the unit's on already, of course. So we just have to tap this this square button to get that display to light up. From there, we're going to use this touch screen uh, to cycle through the mode. So if we see that A plus the plug, that does mean we're in auto mode. Uh, what, we, what it means when we're in auto mode is that's going to default to AC voltage if it's available. If that voltage becomes interrupted at any given time, it's going to automatically start to light on gas. Uh, that is the most common or most popular option is going to be running it like that. If we go one selection further, that's just going to be standalone AC. Uh, without that automatic switch over to propane gas. If I hit it again, it's going to kick us into this 12 volt mode. Uh, now these ammonia absorption systems on uh, 12 volt, and this is, this is our ammonia absorption refrigerator, uh, they're, they're very limited on 12 volt function, very power hungry as well as inefficient. Uh, I'm not going to spend too terribly much time on that, uh, but because of the limitations, uh, Lance in particular does not want you to inadvertently put the refrigerator in that mode, especially if you're on like a boondocking uh, scenario, it's going to pretty quickly uh, deplete your uh, 12 volt battery supply. So because of those limitations, uh, they have installed a secondary switch up top here. Uh, that 12 volt mode will not work unless you physically turn that switch on. As you can see, if we look at the display now, it is no longer blinking. It is indicating green here on the power switch. And that means that we are running on 12 volt. Uh, now, next mode is going to be, a, it looks like a droplet. That's for uh, liquid propane gas. Uh, that's, you know, going to be, in my opinion, the, the most efficient uh, way of running this appliance. Just because it's the most efficient doesn't mean that it's going to always be the best option for you. Uh, going down the road, things like that. I am a fan of running this on propane gas. Just make sure when you're pulling into filling station, things like that, that you are cutting this off before pumping your gas. Um, other than that, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, in terms of, of you know actual function, it's going to function like uh, a dorm style refrigerator. Um, you know, not nothing too much. You do have these little uh, flip out. Um, latches i guess you would call those uh, but what these do is they keep the door from closing all the way so if we bring this over here uh, it's just a little kickstand uh, that's going to keep that door open a little bit uh, and allow that uh, you know keep it from from getting mildewy or, or anything like that um, when the unit's going to be in storage uh, one last thing here on the display and it is pretty self-explanatory um, or two things i should say is this is going to be your temperature control so uh, the more bars you see, uh, the colder it is. And then uh, this last button is a seal defroster. What that is, is just a heating element uh, on the base here where that seal seats. Uh, that's going to keep that, uh, you know, that's going to keep any ice from forming there. So you're getting a nice tight seal every time you close the door. Uh, on this wall here, we have your thermostat. Uh, now this, this utilizes a captive touch Dometic, Dometic thermostat. Uh, what that means is that these are not physical buttons. They are, they are, you know, uh, touch screen, so to speak. Um, and, and to be honest, they're, they're generally not um, as responsive as, as a lot of people like. Uh, I promise you that if you, you push it harder, it does not make it work better. 
Um, so if it's if it's not doing what you want, just be patient with it. Give it another give it another try, uh, and it generally will work well for you. So um, we're gonna push this mode button once. It's gonna take us into the fan speed. Fan speed. Uh, we have to confirm a fan speed before we move on any further. So our choices are low, high, and auto. And just like at home, if we go to either low or high, uh, that fan is going to run indefinitely whether it reaches its set temperature or not. We are talking about air conditioner fan speed here. So um, to kind of keep it going with us or, or keeping it functioning with, with what we're ultimately trying to do, we're going to keep that on auto. That's going to uh, kick that fan off once it meets that set temperature. So once we confirm that fan speed, it's going to kick us into uh, the actual air conditioner mode and it's going to indicate that the thermostat is set to 55 degrees uh, we have an auto fan speed and that we are the snowflake means that we're running the air conditioner um, if I hit that one more time it's going to take us into that furnace mode and from there uh, once it realizes what I'm doing it's going to kick, kick down the air conditioner uh, 16 seconds after that it's actually going to ignite that furnace by that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Uh, now, within that first 15 minutes of operation, it would not surprise me, especially in a unit of this size, if it sets off your smoke alarm here. Uh, it's just unavoidable, essentially, in, a, again, a unit of this size. Uh, and as long as it happens within the first 15 minutes, that is acceptable uh, by the manufacturer's um, recommendations. Uh, and then we're going to go off there. Uh, again, nothing too, too crazy with that. Uh, hit it one more time, takes us to the off mode. Uh, again, talking about your, your smoke alarm here. This runs on a 9-volt battery, just like at home. Uh, is again, part of your secondary safety equipment. Uh, we're going to want to test that, make sure that battery is in working condition. Not a bad idea to keep a spare with you if you have any luck like mine. Uh, that battery is going to go low at like 3 a.m. Uh, and start beeping at you throughout the night. Uh, last piece of safety equipment here is going to be your carbon monoxide LP leak detector. That also does have a twet test button on it, very much like the smoke alarm, uh, and does function very much like the smoke alarm, although uh, it is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. Uh, there's no batteries to change, things like that. Uh, also, again, maybe hard to get some of this. Uh, on camera because we, we are in a small space. Uh, we have your fuse panel breaker box here. So everything here on the right side is going to be a 110 volt uh, light switch style uh, breaker there. Uh, is resettable of course. Everything there on the left is going to be your automotive blade style fuses. Those are replaceable. Again, um, not a bad idea to pick up a variety pack of fuses. Keep them with the unit as fate would have it. If you don't have a spare, you'll probably almost immediately need one. Uh, also, right underneath that fridge, if you didn't know it was there, you might miss it, is going to be your battery disconnect switch there. Uh, if you pull that switch into the out position, that's going to be on or connected. If we go ahead and push it in, that's going to be disconnected. Uh, you're going to utilize that battery disconnect switch uh, for periods of long-term storage. Uh, they're going to help keep any nominal or phantom draws off of that 12-volt system. That's something to keep in mind there. Uh, also behind my back here, we have your charge controller for your solar panels up top. Um, you know, not really much you're going to be controlling here from this area. This gives you a visual readout of, of where your batteries sit in terms of voltage as well as how many amp hours you're taking in via solar. Uh, in this kind of base capacity, again, not, not really much you're going to be doing this other than monitoring uh, those levels and things like that. Um, Batteries are going to be underneath this compartment here. Uh, not really too terribly much to see uh, because again, they are in those sealed battery boxes. Uh, but, but there you go. That is the access point of them. It is a very tight fit to, to wrestle those in and out of there. Uh, so keep that in mind when it does come to, to changing those batteries out. Um, up top here, I uh, get a little... Um, you know, pantry, I guess. Uh, this drawer does slide out to access any of your uh, stuff you're putting there. Um, crawling up here into the cab over here. Um, TV uh, utilizes a, a locking mechanism here. So you have a pull ribbon here. So we have to pull that to unlock it. 
Once we've unlocked it, that's going to allow this to come over. Uh, and you can position that out towards the dinette uh, in the event that you, um, you know, want to watch TV out there. Uh, again, I'm not exactly sure how well this is going to uh, translate onto film, but uh, got some stuff going on back here. Of course, let me plug in the TV. It is a 12 volt TV. Uh, we have this USB, or excuse me, this HDMI plug. Uh, that's communicating the television with the Jensen stereo that we saw uh, down below. Uh, and then if I uh, talk about this, this plate here, that's going to be your antenna booster. So uh, this unit utilizes a King Jack antenna. That antenna gets its power from that booster plate there. Uh, there is a switch and a light that indicates on and off. As long as you see that green light, that means that antenna is getting power. Now there is going to be an on off switch on the antenna itself. Uh, that is very solely for the signal indicator lights. And we're going to hop over there here. So that'll make more sense here in just a few minutes. Uh, but biggest thing with this is go ahead and make sure it is closed or locked and in place uh, before going down the road and just give it a secondary check. Uh, hopping up here to the antenna over here to the antenna, I should say. Uh, this is your King Jack antenna. If I turn that switch on, that's going to turn on that signal indicator. Uh, the more light you see, the higher signal you have. Now, this is an always up digital uh, over the air antenna. The idea is that you're going to directionalize it here until you see the most lights here. Uh, once you do that, you're going to go ahead and run a channel search. It's going to bring in, again, any over the air digital uh, programming that is available. Um, you know, stuff like this, you get some closet space, uh, cabinetry. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, you do have a hike event here. Now, what I'm removing here, this is part of Lance's all-weather package. So in the uh, cabinetry above the dinette, you're going to find more of these. Any rooftop uh, transition, so any skylight, any, any vent fan, and in this case, you have your, uh, your escape hatch, uh, any of those things uh, are going to come with a cover uh, that's going to help further control the temperature within the unit. So uh, once that's removed, uh, just like uh, you know any crank handle, I can go ahead and crank that up. Uh, if I were utilizing it as an escape hatch, I would further uh, pull this red handle. That's going to allow that whole vent to, to kind of come open. Uh, secondary emergency exit window is going to be there. Uh, if you're particularly motivated enough, you could uh, actuate that handle and that window is going to come full out uh, like a doggy door. So uh, multiple options depending on, on the, the specific emergency to, to evacuate the unit. Uh, other than that, up here into the, the cab area bed, uh, you'll find you just have these reading lights, the actual light switches right there on the fixture. Uh, most of these lights that aren't on, uh, so, so really... Other than the two uh, light switches that are on the, 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 the courtesy light or the uh, light switch that you hit directly into the door, they're all going to be individually switched. So you're going to have to turn them all on and off individually. Uh, if you look at the actual fixture, you'll see a little slider. You just slide that back and forth to turn it on and off. Uh, well, that just about covers it here on the inside of the unit. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, we'd be more than happy to touch base or, or go into any of these appliances further uh, if you do have any questions. So, so thanks for watching and, and have a great day.